So we're going to be going through the, uh, like I said, IP networks and then the SIP stacks and the, uh, the NAPs. Okay. And the profiles. Yeah, so network access point here is just a, a terminology that we use uh, most of the time. You will see SIP trunks out there, but we use uh, network access points for uh, other services as well. So uh, we will talk about that. So for uh, our SBC system, we have some uh, IP network requirements. Uh, so uh, most of the time, you will have uh, one management interface that will allow us to control the SBC. So what I mean by control is uh, accessing the configuration, uh, uploading new versions, uh, uploading the license, uh, configuring the system, checking the status. Okay, so normally this is an independent interface. And also this interface is usually a, a private interface. Right? Or it is an interface that is uh, behind a firewall. Uh, the main reason we do this is uh, so that anything that is controlled by the SBC here, any other interface that are controlled by the SBC, uh, the management interface is unaffected by those changes. Okay, so if you make a mistake in any one of those changes here, you'll still have the management interface to access it. Okay. Um, on uh, bare metal systems, you also have a usually a, a uh, backdoor that you get can can get into the system. Like on Dell servers, you have the iDRAC, which allows you to connect if you lose a uh, management uh, interface. And on uh, vir virtual machines, you have a uh, console that you can open on those systems. So the only need, only thing you need is your SSH uh, password. Okay, so your SSH password uh, to access the console, uh, we uh, cannot recover this, right? So you need to make sure that you keep this, uh, this password safe so that you never uh, lose access to the system. And the management interface also is not protected by the SBC. So it's a separate interface. And you will see uh, later when we talk about SBC details, it's a completely independent interface and it's unrelated to the, the rest of the, uh, of the SBC system, okay? So there's no protection on number of packets per second, denial of service attacks or these things, okay? So it needs to be uh, put separately and protected in a separate network. If you don't want this interface, you can still create a new management interface uh, that will be protected by the SBC. Okay? So, but once you connect to the system, then you can add a new management interface uh, in the system. For a, a one plus one system, if you need to have one plus one system, you need to have two control network interfaces that will communicate uh, from the primary to the secondary system. So we saw it briefly yesterday. There was control zero and control one. And when you want to have a one plus one system, you need to have those two control networks. Usually these are on internal private networks and that's how the communication is done between the two systems to allow, um, to allow uh, heartbeat and, and checking uh, of, of the application status and also uh, uh, pushing the configuration to the secondary device. So everything will go through this contr internal control network interface. Then you can have one or multiple uh, interfaces for SIP calls. Uh, if you look in the configuration, you will see they are called LAN one interface because usually they are used for a local area network or a wide area network. These interface that you will create in the system will be 
protected by the SBC functionality, so the security that is included in the SBC. And you have, uh, you have well, you can have just one of those interfaces. So some, some installation we see as only one interface and they are used for all the traffic. But most of the time you have at least two, one for the wide area network and one for the local network. Uh, but I see also a lot of installation which has uh, much more interfaces to interconnect to various uh, networks through the same SBC. And then if you need to have transcoding in the system, you will need to have two additional interfaces which are of type LAN1 and when you allocate those interfaces, you will then assign them for uh, controlling the, uh, or, or transferring RTP to the uh, transcoding devices. Okay. So let me show you this in uh, uh, diagrams. Okay, so if you have a standalone SBC, you will have just one uh, device uh, running on the system. Uh, you will have your management interface that connects to the SVC. And then you will have one LAN, one interface for the LAN, another one for the WAN. And if you need more, you can just add more in the system. Okay. Each of those are represented by a physical interface on your server. Okay. So if you have a bare metal server, these are real uh, network cards which are uh, dedicated for this. And if you have a virtual machine, then these interfaces that are given to the uh, uh, SBC or to the guest running on the VM system, uh, it will then be a, one of those interfaces. Then you have one plus one uh, networks. Okay. You have uh, your management interface connecting to your primary SBC. And then you have another management interface connecting to the secondary SBC. Both of them can be accessed independently you can access the uh, console or the web portal from the main or the primary system or from the secondary system and you can configure everything uh, from both of these interfaces. Then when you uh, allocate your LAN1 interfaces, well on the secondary SBC, you need to have the same LAN1 interfaces here. Okay. Um, when the system configures the LAN interface, maybe you called it the LAN zero. Well, here it needs to recognize that this same interface is also LAN zero and it's connected to the same network here. So that if there, there's some traffic coming into the system and then there's a fallback that occurs, the IP will be reconfigured on the secondary device and the data will then flow through the secondary SBC. When one of these interface uh, fail, there's no switchover. But if the primary SBC system fails, then both of the interface will now be uh, configured here and uh, they will uh, take the uh, IP addresses that were configured on these interface and reallocate them here so that the traffic will then flow through this interface there, going in and out of the SBC. Then if you have a one plus one system, you need to have a control network. This control network are two separate interfaces that are allocated on the systems and they connect to the secondary device here as also two separate interfaces. And there is continuously communication being sent between the two systems here so that they keep in sync. The database is, the, the configuration database is synced and all the application uh, talk to each other. Control one is for uh, redundancy here. Okay. And like I said, the 
a network device name, so LAN zero or, or the name that you have put for that network device must be the same on both servers. All right, you need to have the same name for this interface and the same name for this interface here. Is that clear? Okay. Next is if you use uh, transcoding. So you can use transcoding with just uh, one uh, primary SBC or with a primary and a secondary SBC. Uh, you need only one transcoding device uh, on a one plus one system for it to work. And you see all the other interfaces are the same, management, LAN one, control zero, control one. But to be able to do transcoding, you need to add two interfaces called trans zero and trans one. Uh, then uh, when there is transcoding that needs to be done, so you will have traffic coming in to the primary SBC like this. And uh, before going out on the WAN, it will take the transcoding path go to the transcoding device here, transcode it and send it back to the uh, SBC so that it can go out back out on the WAN interface. Okay, so this is the RTP path that is transcoded. Understood? So now I want to show you just a little bit uh, the uh, uh, naming convention that we use uh, in various uh, environments. In bare metal, okay, so if you use a bare metal server, you have uh, physical interfaces on your system. All right? So here I show two physical interfaces, but maybe you have uh, more physical interfaces connected here. For each of the physical interface, you will need to have uh, define one network device with a specific name. So for example, uh, the, the names by default when you allocate them will be LAN zero and WAN zero, but you can change or, or oh no, maybe it's VoIP zero and VoIP one, but you can uh, change those names to make it more uh, significant for you when you configure initially. However, like I said, on the primary and secondary system, they need to have the same name. So first you configure the network, network devices which match the physical parts on the system. Once you have, and this is configured uh, at the initial setup of the system. All right. Once you finish the initial setup, then you can configure the rest of the information for the uh, IP interfaces and virtual ports. If you want to change a network device after initial configuration, you need to go back and do a reset network device roles. Okay? And I will show you how to do that later. So now when you uh, do the initial configuration, you have your network device configured, you get into the uh, web interface, you can start configuring your virtual ports. And your virtual ports can be uh, of two types, either untagged or with a specific VLAN. Okay? So then you can configure uh, some of these ports, uh, virtual ports on the same interface with different VLAN values, or uh, it can be untagged. Okay. And you can do the same on LAN zero. They could be on the same VLANs, but usually uh, uh, these are separated in your network. So you have uh, different VLANs uh, for the one and the LAN. All right, so you need to configure all your VLANs and then on each of those VLANs, you can configure IP interfaces. So for example, here I've configured two IP interfaces uh, on this VLAN, which goes through this network device. And then another IP interface here that goes through the VLAN here. So maybe for example, here I have the IP, uh, I don't know, 204 dot something uh, on VLAN 16 going out through this network interface. Here, of course, on the network, when you connect here, if you're using VLAN 16 on the network switches, you need to make sure that VLAN 16 exists so that the tagged packets that go out here will be able to go in the network. And it's the same here. You will have, you can have one or two or more IP interfaces internally. 
Of course, the default configuration is to have uh, one one interface with untagged VLAN and one IP interface here. And then you have one uh, network device for the LAN, untagged, and one IP interface. So this is the simplest configuration. Everything is untagged and uh, you have just two IP interface, one for outside, one for inside. But you, you can see that you can go much further in the configuration. When you do a, a virtual installation, uh, you have uh, one more layer that you need to uh, be aware of. It's is the hypervisor, all right? So uh, for VMware, for example, it's ESX. And then you have, uh, you need one more step to do, okay? So in your hypervisor, you have your physical devices. Before you start your SBC instance here, you will have created or, or assigned network interfaces to the, um, to the guest, okay? So here, uh, the SBC is the guest of the uh, VM system. And the guest here as uh, will, when you start the system, you will see those interfaces here at initial setup, and you need to assign what they are, okay? So, here in this case, uh, it will be uh, WAN zero and LAN zero, for example. You give those names to that. And you see here, here the rest of the configuration is the same. Okay, so you have virtual ports with VLANs or untagged, and then you have your IP interfaces here, and you can have multiple IP interfaces on each one of those uh, networks. Two uh, to have the ability to do this this way, there's one thing you have to be careful is that the uh, uh, VLAN ID that you assign uh, the network interface to the guest uh, needs to be uh, the VLAN ID 4096. This is actually a, a invalid VLAN ID, but it tells the guest OS that you can use any VLANs on this hypervisor, okay? So any, any VLAN you configure will go through the hypervisor and go out here tagged with the value that was put here. So for example, maybe VLAN six here, okay? Going out as VLAN six. Whoops, that's not a six. There you go, okay. Now, the other way you can do this is to have the hypervisor manage the VLANs. Right? So you have your physical devices here, just as you had before, except that when you assign the interfaces to the guest, you uh, will specify the VLAN right here. Right? So in the hypervisor, you can configure to control the VLANs. And then when you get to the, um, the SBC itself, and the SBC will see those interfaces now. WAN zero, which will be VLAN 16. WAN one, which will be VLAN 17. And then LAN zero will be VLAN five. And LAN one will be VLAN six. Okay? And when you configure your IP interfaces on this particular WAN zero, well, they will be tagged 16 going out okay? because the hypervisor will have tagged those devices. But here, when you configure the virtual parts, they are untagged. Okay. Is that clear? All right. So you can have it controlled by the hypervisor or controlled by the SBC. All right, so you have the choice of your configuration. Now, the other uh, installation we have is a cloud installation. So um, here I just represented the cloud with, with a, a box here, okay? And you have the SBC that is your instance started in the cloud. 
Uh, the cloud devices here uh, will assign uh, this interface, okay? So it depends on where you install uh, your SVC, where you install the instance of this SVC, and it will, that will tell you which uh, public IP you will get on, on this system. The network device here that you uh, allocate uh, will always have a, a virtual port untagged here. All right, so you can't configure a, a VLAN here. So, and then the IP interfaces, well, you can still have multiple IP interfaces here. However, um, the, by default, you have only one, okay? And it, it, does, it has also the management interface, okay? It's all, everything is on the same port like this. So if you want to have multiple uh, interfaces, then you need to create a new one, add one, oops, add one on the system like this, okay? So then you will have another interface. So to be able to do this, before you start the instance, you need to go in the cloud configuration and uh, add a new IP interface. Uh, well, it's called, uh, I think it's called Ethernet uh, network or something like that in the uh, configuration of the cloud. Okay. So let me continue. So this is the uh, uh, initial network configuration page. So when you get to this page, uh, it, is, it is important to configure this uh, correctly. All right. So you have in here, you will see uh, all kinds of information about your networks. All right. So you will, uh, for example, here, have at least one management interface, which is the interface you're using right now to configure the system. And it will be tagged as MGMT or management with the value management zero. And usually it's, it's yellow here when it tells you that that's the one you are using right now to connect to the system. Okay, so you can't, or, or you have to be careful if you want to change this one, because this is the one we're using to configure. Okay. Um, then you can have other management interfaces. This is seldom used, but uh, that's, that's one way to do it. Uh, if you have a one plus one system, then you will have these two interfaces appear in the system. Okay, so, and, and you see here the MAC addresses, that's how you can choose which interface uh, you want to be your management, your control network, and your LAN1 interfaces. Here, uh, if you press on the plus, you will get more information about those interfaces and you will see uh, not only the MAC address, but the type of interface and, and uh, other information, if it's connected and stuff like that. Um, and only the interfaces that are compatible will be allowed to do LAN1 here. Okay? So on, on a lot of those uh, servers out there, uh, there are some interfaces that are not compatible with the SBC and we cannot select them here as uh, SBC protected interfaces. Uh, by default here, you will get uh, these names and you can change these names to make it more uh, uh, clear for your installation. Any interface here that is subject to uh, attacks, so usually all the WAN interfaces, but you can also put the WAN interface, should have dedicated CPU for uh, processing the packets. So this is very important. Otherwise, if you have a, an attack on those ports, it won't be able to handle all the traffic. Now, it's not because here I have four dedicated CPU uh, check marks that is going to use four, four CPU cores, right? The system will verify the uh, bandwidth required for each of those interfaces and will assemble them on the same CPU core if it can. Okay, so maybe some of them will be reserved, but not necessarily four. Um, 
and we will go uh, in more details on this uh, in the day number four uh, on SBC details. Um, in addition to this, if you have some interfaces that are present here, but you will not use, you will uh, have to set them as uh, type unused. Okay? So that means the SVC will not manage those interfaces and it will, it will put them aside. Okay? But any other interface you don't plan to use should be marked as uh, unused. Okay, so unused is uh, this choice here. Okay. So this is for one plus one system and transcoding. This is for SVC and also for transcoding. And this one here is for controlling the system. Questions on this? Let me continue. So you, uh, that's the initial uh, startup page. So you have a few questions to answer, like is it a one plus one system? Do you have a transcoding device? And then you configure those network interfaces. Once this has been done, it takes a few minutes to set up the system. And then in the uh, IP interface section of the configuration, you can see the ethernet ports that are currently allocated on the system. Okay, so you will see if you have uh, control ports for the one plus one system, all of your LAN or WAN interfaces on the system, and then uh, your management interfaces. And here you see I have two, two management interface because I have two servers. It's a one plus one system. One is called A2, one is called A3. So I can access the A2 system using this management zero interface and A3 using this management zero interface. And same thing for control zero. You can see I have one on the first server, one on the second server. Same thing for control, uh, control one. And also the LAN one interface, all of them have two times the same name because they're running on the two servers at the same time. Huh? So the, uh, these parts here cannot be changed after it. It's only defined at initial configuration. So if you want to change them later, you need to go in uh, a specific menu. Okay, so O status action and then change network device roles. When you do that, you're gonna go back to the previous uh, page here and you'll be able to uh, select new interfaces for your system. And like I said, you need to use the MAC address to make sure you're using this, the right interfaces uh, on the systems. Okay, right. so this is here, the uh, uh, ethernet ports or network devices, okay? And then you have your virtual ports, okay? Right. So the virtual ports, you will only be able to configure the ones that are called uh, LAN1 here. All right, so you see, for example, the control zero and control one interfaces. Well, you see you have no delete here and you can't, if you click on it, you can't modify anything. All right, same thing for management zero. All right, here you can't delete it and you can't uh, change it because that's how you reach the system. So we don't want to uh, have this modified. So the only way to modify this is to uh, uh, go on the console of the system and then you can change the IP uh, of this. If you need to change on which network interface card it's going, then you need to go back to the network, uh, reset network device roles and change them again. Okay. Um, then your LAN1 interface you can change. So you see I have now four uh, LAN1 interfaces on those, uh, on this system. Uh, you see they are running on both uh, servers at the same time, but only one of them is active, of course. Uh, I have one WAN interface here, uh, and here I named the uh, port as 800 because I want 
to remember this is VLAN 800 here. So I just put a name that is uh, coherent. You see here LAN 600, like 601. Okay, and then I can put also a name like this, a private and then public, just to make it, it clear when you configure the rest of the system. Then I have one special one here that's called LAN all. And that's one that uses the VLAN ID 4096. And here I can put multiple VLANs on the same interface. So, so for that specific interface, I just need to uh, add multiple VLANs. Okay, and, and uh, here I don't think I showed the configuration specifically for that, but it's very simple. You just put the VLAN, uh, you just put the VLAN ID Okay, so when you configure LAN 600, you just put the VLAN ID 600 in there. So it's very simple. Okay, so I just uh, confirm here the VLANs. Uh, you configure the VLANs in the virtual ports uh, or VLANs are untagged. Okay, and then on, in the bare metal portion of the system, uh, you will use a direct VLAN configuration. So if you use untagged on the server, it's gonna go untagged out on the network interface. If you use a specific VLAN, then you'll need to configure that VLAN in the internet switches because that's how it's gonna go out of the system. On the virtual machine, like I was explaining, it's either controlled by the hypervisor or by the guest host if you use VLAN uh, 4096, VLAN ID 4096. Now, once you have your uh, Ethernet ports configured, and then you configured your virtual ports, so any VLAN you want to use in the system, then you can configure your IP interfaces. Right? So your IP interfaces here, you can only uh, modify the ones that are of type uh, LAN 1. You will not be able to modify the ones that are for uh, control or, or management. So the IP interface is here. When you uh, want to configure this, you uh, need to put the, of course, the IP address and the net mask and the gateway for these uh, interfaces. Uh, and uh, you need to specify which VLAN you are using. Okay. So which VLAN, which virtual port, and what's the IP address, uh, or you use DHCP. Uh, to configure this, okay. But most of the time for LAN 1 interface, people use uh, static IP addresses for that. And here you can see that I have on the same virtual port, I have two VLANs, okay? on the same virtual port, I have VLAN 604 and 605, and I have two different IP addresses on the, on the same uh, virtual port. Any questions on the IP interfaces configuration? Okay. Then you have RTP port range. These are created automatically when you create a new IP interface. So as soon as you create uh, one IP interface, it's gonna add one entry in this table here and you uh, will have a default port range or RTP port range for this interface. So by default, it's always 20,000 to 40,000. Uh, and then you can uh, see on which interface these ports are available. And uh, if you create a network access point that uses those RTP port range, you will see them here. Okay, so you will see them appear here. So you can go on the nap and know which one is using your RTP. So what will happen is every time you make a call using this uh, RTP port range or, or using this network access point, it will use one of these uh, ports, uh, RTP ports in that range. 
So most of the time it doesn't matter and that's the reason why they are created automatically. But if you want to adjust that to specific values, then you can do so. Okay, so that's it for the uh, IP interface section. So you have, you can configure multiple network devices, then you can multiple, multiple VLANs on each one of those devices, and you can configure your IP interfaces that will be attached there. These IP interfaces is what you will use in the rest of the configuration to know how the packets, SIP packets, RTP packets, uh, and any of the other type of traffic will go out or in to the system. Then you have the uh, SIP stack. So to be able to receive and send calls in, uh, in or out of the system, you need to have a, a, a SIP uh, stack running in the system. This uh, SIP stack has some uh, configuration that can be done inside. Um, one of the configuration that can be done are called uh, quarks and these will apply to all the system, all right? So when you do the change on that SIP stack, it will change the behavior of the whole SIP stack of the whole SBC, okay? So in here, you have some uh, various quirks. Some of them you see are enabled by default, okay? So these things are uh, added by default. Oh, let me take a note here. I just saw something interesting. Okay, so if you select other uh, information like this, it will change the behavior of the uh, SIP stack. Okay, when you change the behavior here and you activate the configuration, it will restart the SIP stack and you will lose all the traffic. So you have to be careful that when you, if you want to do a change here that uh, you, you do it uh, in a management, uh, in, a, in a window. Uh, for management of the system, okay? Um, most of the things you do in the web portal will not affect the, the, the system, right? You can just change everything. But the SIP quarks in particular, if you change something here, it will restart the SIP stack and you will lose the traffic. Okay. You then have um, uh, SIP header parameters. Okay, these SIP header parameters are uh, shown in the configuration and you can decide what you will include in the SIP message. So for example, uh, the user agent field can be uh, modified. All right, so you can modify what is being sent when you make a call. Uh, you can configure the provisional acknowledge. So in some, uh, in some environments, we need to use uh, prex, and uh, this is where you can configure it. But there's also other parameters that you can say, uh, by default, we send the date and time, and you can remove that. So you have a list of parameters there that you can uh, adjust. So I, can, I will show you that uh, later. Then you have also in this part of the configuration, uh, session timers, all right? So session timers are uh, enabled by default on the SBC. And uh, what this does is when you establish the call, uh, after a certain period of time, we will send a new SIP request to verify if the connection is still up. If there is no reply on this, it will drop the call. All right, so it's a protection for uh, endpoints which disappear and become unavailable uh, so that the connections don't stay open forever. All right, so normally succession timers are uh, active. Uh, however, you can configure the, um, the refresh time. Okay, so by default it is it is, I will show you later, I don't remember. Okay. Now, 
the so you configure the basic uh, architecture of the SIP stack, and then what you need to do is create some uh, what we call transport servers. Okay, so this what does it do? It it defines the local interfaces on which you can send and receive traffic. So for example, uh, I want to configure one here that's called TCP 5060. So I'm using port 5060 to send and receive traffic. It's configured in TCP and I use this private interface. All right, so you can only use one IP interface for uh, doing this. Uh, here I have another example, it's a UDP. Uh, UDP, but this one is on a public network. Uh, so it's using a public network. I have two other here interfaces and I have one more, which is a TLS 5061. And you see here the name I give is, is meaningful, right? So I can quickly recognize what interface this is uh, on my system. So this is a public interface on VLAN 800 and it's using TLS on port 5061, right? So it's easy to identify what this uh, interface is. So now if I, I use this configuration on the SBC, I can receive call on port 5060 on each of those interfaces. This one, it has to be TCP. The other ones is UDP. And then this interface is using TLS on port 5061. All right, so that's how I can receive traffic and that's where I will be able to send traffic from. Okay, so I have some, uh, some call flows for uh, SIP. Okay. Um, what you have to be careful when you look at the uh, SIP call flows in the system is that you have two legs on the system and you have uh, SDP information. So SDP information is the IP address where to send the RTP, the UDP port, and the codecs to use for this particular call. All right, so the SDP is here. And when you receive a call on the SBC, it will tell you what is the, how can I, how can the remote side receive the RTP information? Okay, so it tells you this. Then you have processing of the remote leg. So when we send here this uh, request to CB, we will say where we want to receive our RTP traffic when the remote side uh, answers either with a 183 or a 200 then it will tell us okay this is where i want to receive my, my rtp okay so this is my ip address my udp port and which codecs i want to use and then the same thing here when we send it on this side we will say how we want to receive the media from the remote side then there is, uh, once, you've, uh, go, uh, once you've reached the 183, or, or I will show you later other situation, then you will have early media flowing from the remote side to the incoming side. And the, the path will have been open here in the SBC so that the traffic can uh, flow through. Then when the call is accepted, then there will be also RTP traffic going from uh, this side and this side. Okay. Uh, and uh, in, in a lot of cases, it's, it's G711 that is being used on these, uh, on these systems. And just to uh, understand what's the traffic generated by RTP. Uh, each packet by default is 20 milliseconds and this will create 50 packets per second through uh, the interface uh, going to one of the SIP legs and uh, coming in from the other SIP leg. 
I will show you uh, the SIPStack configuration uh, after this presentation in the web portal. Okay, so um, there is uh, SDP negotiation when you uh, make a call with SIP. Um, for example, here there is uh, offers of codecs that can be used in the system. So zero is uh, G711 and eight is uh, G711, well, zero is G711 MULA and eight is G711 ALA. Okay, and then uh, usually the SBC, well, you can configure the profile here on the SBC to say which codecs are allowed to go through the system. Or you can say, well, pass everything that is available. Okay, so, and, and you can configure this on the SBC to restrict some codecs or to allow everything. And then, uh, so by default, if you receive 08, it's gonna send 08 to the remote side, but maybe the remote side will force you to use a specific codec, okay? And when you receive this, the SBC will also use this configuration to send to the uh, incoming side, and then uh, zero will not be able to be used in this case. So if this is the call flow that we are using here, it will be using G711 ALA for the communication without the possibility to change uh, the uh, codec while the call is going on. Okay. Except of course for T38. So if you're using, uh, if you're using fax on your systems, well, this will override the SDP configuration and it will re-invite in uh, T38. Then you have uh, early media, which uh, are, let's say, um, uh, varies uh, per network and you need to manage this. Okay, uh, sometimes it works out of the box and sometimes you need to manage uh, this and the uh, SBC offers you a possibility to do these kinds of uh, configurations, okay? So one example is that you get a 183 uh, with SDP information that tells you where uh, to send the data and how you can receive the data. And then the early media will flow through the system like this. But there's also a possibility where you get a 180 ringing and there is, there is no uh, early media on this particular leg. Okay. So one thing we can do in the uh, SBC is to have early media adaptation. Here we show one particular case where you receive a 180 ringing and uh, you know you will get no early media because of this. And when we send that out to the incoming side, well, then we can uh, change this, modify this to include early media. So then the uh, incoming side will hear the uh, ring back tone when we receive this call. This uh, file here will be played uh, from a transcoding device. So of course you need to have one available in your system. And so when you, uh, uh, when the, the ringing starts, you will hear the early media played from the SVC uh, file that has been loaded on the system. And then there's uh, other configurations you can do to modify the network behavior from uh, 180 to 183. You see you have uh, four different options here. Uh, if you check here the generate uh, 180, uh, 183, 
uh, you have uh, the description of each of these uh, items, right? So by, well, default is the, the default mode. And then uh, you see what it does, right? It says attempt to generate SDP on outgoing leg, except when we receive a 180 without SDP. All right? And then you have forward, which means generate SDP on outgoing leg when receiving SDP on incoming link. All right? Otherwise, there is no SDP. All right? And then always generate SDP. So that means we will uh, play something on the outgoing link. All right? So there's all kinds of configuration like this. Some of, the, some of these are, if there's a 180 with SDP, well, we assume that this is early media, that early media is on, okay? So you can change this behavior here. Uh, we can remap these values that don't have SDP to a 180 with SDP or the reverse, right? Uh, remap the 180 with SDP to a 183 with SDP. All right, so you can uh, really tune the system so that it manages those discrepancies that works. Now, if you, um, if you accept to do uh, uh, early media or you accept to change early media and the system needs to uh, play, those, uh, play those ring back tones instead of passing it from the outbound leg to the inbound leg, it plays those uh, uh, ring back tone files. Uh, you can configure this in the uh, profile section. Well, actually that's all in the profiles, right? I forgot to say that in the profiles here, and you can control um, uh, which group of tones will be used. And uh, also the early media uh, ringtone generation behavior. Okay. So normally it's uh, automatic and forward uh, from outgoing to incoming call. So this is the regular mode here. But you can, for example, I have seen this being used before, always play ringtone because the remote side uh, sends us information that is not coherent. So then we can override this information and make sure we always play the, ring, uh, the ringtone here. And then you can configure this ringtone in the system to decide uh, which file to play or which tone uh, segment to play. So other things you can do in the uh, profile is the uh, SDP configuration. So I think this is one of the most important part of the uh, profiles because that will tell you what you allow to be remapped on the other side, okay, on the other leg. So the first leg has some SDP information and the other leg has other SDP information. If you look in the default SDP configuration of the system, you get uh, something like this. It's only three lines, only three lines like this, which defines the codex that will be used. Okay, so 0, 8, 4, 18, 101, and 13, which I will show you on the next page. And uh, since 101 here is a dynamic payload type, you need to define this uh, 101 value here. Okay? All of these other are a static payload type, so you don't need to define them here. Okay. So anything that is above 96 will be a dynamic payload, and you will need to define it here. Um, if you want, okay, you there's an option here that says generate all SDP parameters, and if you select that option, it will all the information for each of the uh, payload types, even if uh, they are static payload types. Okay? So for example, zero, it will force to put that information in the outgoing column. If it's eight okay, and four and uh, 18, 101 and 13.
So the RTP payload types here, you saw 0, 4, 8 on the previous page. So these are defined in the, uh, well, I didn't put the uh, RFC, but there's an RFC that describes uh, this specifically. So zero is a, a MULA, four is 723, and then uh, eight is ALA. Comfort noise is 13, and then you have 18, which is the 729, and um, uh, AMR white band is a dynamic one, so you need to uh, uh, specify a value. So it could be, for example, 96 or another value. But when you define 96, you need to also define what is this uh, payload type, and you will have to put the information about AMR white band inside this uh, SDP configuration page, just like we do here for uh, G729. Or, or others. Okay, we had a question here on uh, 183, 183 here, okay? So by default, if I receive a 183 from the remote leg, we'll just send 183 on the incoming leg and the RTP stream will be opened from the outgoing leg to the incoming leg like this, okay? Uh, so it doesn't need a transcoder in this case, okay? If, um, if you want to override this, for example, uh, here, you want to override this so you receive a 180 ringing and uh, you want to send here a 183 then you will need to have a transcoding device to uh, send that okay so it's only if you convert from no media received from the remote leg and media uh, sent on the incoming leg will you need to have a transcoding if there is no transcoder then this will not play a file here Okay, so you, you won't, you still won't hear anything even if we open the path. But if I remember well, there's a warning in the web interface when you try to configure something that requires transcoding and it's not in the system. So, uh, did, did that answer your question, Rudy? Um, other configuration you can do in the profiles is uh, the codec selection mode. All right, so you have two choices. One, keep all common codecs and active is keep only one active codec. All right, so uh, if we say active, so that means if we receive uh, a choice of vocoders, I don't know, 0, 8, 18, and then the remote side returns also 0, 8, 18. Well, we will use only the first one. And, and I didn't mention this, but when you have your uh, SDP configuration like this, 0 is the highest priority codec. So if everybody has 0 as the highest priority, then it will be chosen. Um, and by default, the SBC will always uh, choose the interfaces from the remote sides as a priority. Okay. But you can also force the SBC to use its own priority. So you can change the configuration to do that. Okay. Uh, now, if you keep all common codecs, that means that uh, if you have zero, eight, and four that are all uh, accepted by both sides, they will be kept in the configuration, in the call, so that if the call changes from zero to eight or eight to four in the middle of the call, it will be uh, still accepted, okay? So those packets will pass normally, okay? Then you have the other option is allow 
uh, other codecs. Allow other codecs. So that means uh, if uh, you don't know, if the SBC doesn't know those codecs, so maybe it has a new value of 110 and uh, it has the codec uh, ABC, which the SBC doesn't know, it's going to be removed. Okay? However, if you choose uh, true, then even the, 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 uh, even the codecs that are unknown by the SBC will still be uh, relayed to the other side and the RTP traffic will still go through. Okay. But of course, you won't be able to control uh, these types of uh, streams okay? because the SBC doesn't know about them. Okay, so on, on our wiki, we have the list of all the codecs that are uh, known by the system. And maybe the thing I did not mention is that those, those profiles, you can figure all the information in the profiles and then you attach it to a network access point. So all those configurations can be assigned to just one NAP or uh, multiple NAP with the same, uh, same parameters. Okay. So you don't have to reconfigure this for each of the network access points that you configure in the system. Um, other important uh, parameters that you have in the profiles, uh, you have enable SIP custom headers. All right, so this is, if you know, you will be receiving uh, special types of packet like P headers and X headers, and you want to manage them in the routing scripts, well, you need to have those SIP custom headers enabled. Okay? Uh, if you don't have them enabled, first, it will not be shown in the routing script, so you will not have access to those parameters. And second, it will not pass to the outgoing leg so you will uh, not be able to see those uh, headers on the other side of the network, which is uh, uh, preferable in, in uh, a lot of cases. But at the same time, if you have, have them available in the routing scripts, you can then uh, handle all those parameters and read the, those information. One example that I will also show uh, tomorrow in the call routing is that you can receive, for example, a SIP header that has a value that you want to put in the CDR. Okay, so maybe it's X uh, CDR info, something like that. So you can read it in the writing script and push it into the CDR. So that's interesting to, uh, to have uh, this function available. But to be able to receive those custom header, you need to have this uh, parameter uh, set correctly. Uh, another parameter you have here is drop call, drop call thresholds. All right? So then you can control a SIP call which has uh, no RTP received. All right? So you have a stream of RTP for each of the SIP calls that you have active. And if you don't receive for a certain amount of time that you define here, it will automatically drop those calls from the system. By default, this is disabled. So the value is uh, zero. The value is zero, that means it is disabled. Okay, so if you want to enable it, you just have to put a specific uh, drop call threshold value. Yeah, so if you have a silent suppression uh, enabled on the system, this is handled automatically. Uh, so the system, when you have silent suppression, will uh, not count the packets the same way. So for example, if you use G711 uh, ALA, you will have 50 packets per second, and we need to have the right amount of packets for uh, X amount of second be before we drop the call. If uh, there's silent suppression, we will receive less packets, but since it's silent suppression, we can detect this is true and it will not drop the call. The same way, if we are put on hold, if the call is put on hold, you won't receive any RTP packets in that moment. And the drop call threshold is also 
uh, uh, not active in that period of time. Okay. So it's it's pretty safe to enable this uh, this feature, especially if you have networks that are let's say flaky and you don't want to leave them open for long periods of time. Um, and also you have the choice, right? A SIP session timer may be sufficient. So you can use either uh, a SIP session timer or this feature of RTP uh, monitoring or just uh, not use it at all. And we, I showed you uh, quickly a uh, ring back tones that you can configure, which tones will be played. Uh, and also if you have, uh, well, you need transcoding if you need to play a uh, file there. Okay. And then you have uh, LNP options. We have all kinds of uh, uh, options for LNP. You can uh, uh, terminate the um, uh, number portability, you can relay it to the outgoing leg or you can route with this uh, LNP information. So we have various uh, cases uh, that we support here. The last thing in the profiles, well, I showed you uh, briefly yesterday. Uh, you can uh, modify the reason cause from one leg to the other. So for example, uh, you want, to, you have a, a incoming side and an outgoing side and the outgoing side returns you a, a 606. But on the incoming side, you don't want to send a 606, you want to send something else. So here you can decide to remap this value. So the 606 that you receive, if you choose here 604 instead, well, your incoming leg will be using 604 instead. Okay, so you turn, the call is terminated from the remote side that with 606 and we send 604 and the incoming. So for each of these um, cases, you can configure them as you want it, like 603, 600, 503, and, and that's what we did yesterday for uh, the fraud uh, configuration, right? Where we had uh, 603 was uh, decline the call and 503 was accept the call. Okay, so we can just change this here to allow uh, continue call, uh, drop call, stop call. Here we can configure uh, to have uh, special files to play uh, in case it's busy congestion or congestion, but you need to have, um, you need to have the transcoding device to play these files. Okay. okay, that's it for the profiles. Any questions on this? Any other questions I should say? Everything is good, let's continue. Network access points, or uh, like I said, they're called uh, SIP trunks. So most likely you will have a multiple of those network access points in the system. And they define uh, the uh, entry point on the ESBC, okay, or the local interface, how you will receive traffic. And it, it defines also uh, the remote side, so where we will send the traffic, okay? So how can we receive the traffic and how can we send this traffic? Um, you will have uh, also the option to use SIP polling and that is using the method, uh, the SIP options method uh, to send a request to the remote side. If the SIP option uh, message is answered by anything, the uh, network access point will be considered available. If the remote side does not answer, then the SIP, uh, the SIP nap will, be, will remain down. And you have to, um, uh, and sometimes the remote sides, they don't answer to SIP options, even if they're up, 
Right? So then you need to disable zip polling for this to work. In the network access point, you can also configure a access control list, okay, which I will show you uh, in a minute. And you can configure call and mission control on this particular next network access point. You can also attach um, network address uh, translations or netting, either local netting or remote netting on this, uh, on this particular net. So you have the definition of the local transport server. So this you saw we already configured in the SIP stack. So you defined your local interface, your local, I mean, IP interface, your local UDP or TCP or, or TLS port that you will be using. All right? So it defines where you will receive the traffic on the SBC. And uh, you also define the remote IP address or the remote domain right, that you can figure here and uh, the remote port, which can be different from the local port that you have in the system. So you see the, um, the, uh, it, the configuration here is, is uh, fairly straightforward, right? You put the destination IP and port and then um, you need to use uh, this IP here Okay, I will show you when you don't want to use this later. And you should always have this on as well so that you make sure that only packets coming from this IP and this port will be accepted in the system. So in that particular NAP configuration, you have your access control list. So uh, you, it's not mandatory, so you can use only one of these uh, IPs as a destination. Uh, but as, as a source here, you can have uh, more than one IP. So for here, what you do is you enter the IP and mask of that uh, subnet here, and then you press the arrows, and then they will be added here. And you see this is a single IP here, another single IP, and there is some net here. So all the packets that come from this network, 2.110.52.28.0, will be accepted in the system. Also from this IP and this IP, plus from this IP here, because we know that's the uh, remote IP. Now, if you, in some cases, we will want to have what we call a open net, okay? So most of the time, this is used only for uh, registration requests. So that means we don't know who will send a request for registration in the system. And um, so what we do here is we uh, remove the use proxy address because we don't know what's the IP and port of the remote here. So we remove this and then we need to set here, accept only authorized users. So what, what will this do is that if you get a registration request and it's within the acceptable parameters of the SBC, this will be relayed to the registrar. If the registrar accepts this registration request, then the uh, user will be accepted in the system and then he will be able to make calls. Okay. The, uh, what we call the open NAP can be uh, completely open. So I, we say here, you can receive from any source, but if you know that you can only receive a registration request from uh, specific subnets, then it's a good idea to add a access control list on each one of those uh, possible source of traffic, all right? So you have less chance of getting uh, pollution from uh, other system trying to register to your uh, device.
So this, we uh, mentioned this yesterday. Uh, so you can have different ports here. The ports can be different on the SBC and outside. Uh, and then the protocols can be different here. You can have uh, domain names for the destination, or you can have domain names also uh, to receive traffic. Okay, so uh, so if you want to have uh, traffic coming in a specific domain, that you can configure a domain here on the SBC, and this will pass the registration request to the right registrar according to the domain that you have used here. Okay. And this I mentioned also yesterday as well. So you have a uh, choice of UDP, TCP, or TLS. Uh, UDP, TCP are straightforward. You just uh, select which mode you want to use. There's not that many services are there that use uh, TCP. But I know, for example, uh, the Avaya PBX use TCP and, and uh, Skype for Business use TCP. But otherwise, most of them use UDP. If you want to use TLS, then it requires a bit more uh, configuration. So you need to have certificates in the system and you need to um, attach them to those uh, interfaces. Okay. So we will sh I will show you that later today. When you configure your network access point, uh, so you allocate the IP address or the domain and maybe your access control list, if you want to do polling um, and you can assign it a profile. So maybe you have defined already some profiles, for example, uh, G7, G711 or G729. Uh, and uh, let's say this one, for example, uh, I know is, well, I only want to use G729 on this uh, network. So then I can force G729, okay? And then in this network access point, I will use this profile so that this is what is applied. There is also a, a place where you can configure a registration information. So the SBC can register the SIP trunk to an outside registrar. Uh, so uh, you can uh, configure uh, the uh, remote uh, registrar in there. So you can configure the domain of the registrar and uh, the credentials you will use for this particular connection. And when you connect uh, initially, you will send a register request and it will return uh, 401 or 407 to uh, say, okay, you need to register uh, with uh, this uh, uh, information I sent you. And then we will send the, the final request for uh, registration, okay? So there's two ways that uh, the carriers do it. Most of them, they just use the IP uh, of the SBC to validate that this is a correct uh, source, or you can use registration and this is uh, possible to do. Oops. Okay. Now in the NAPS, you can configure call and mission control. Uh, you have all these parameters available here. So you can say, I want to have a maximum call per second on this network access point that is incoming or outgoing, or you can choose maximum incoming calls per second or maximum outgoing calls per second. And the example I was giving uh, yesterday is for example, there's a carrier that cannot process more than 25 calls per second. So you can configure this here and then uh, there's no, uh, when, when we reach uh, 26 call per second, well, the, 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 the last call will be forwarded towards another network access point, which can handle this traffic instead of overloading that particular network.
in addition to the outgoing calls per second, you can configure also a call burst. So for, uh, let's say for uh, one second, you can have a few more calls uh, being sent, but over time, it should be 25 calls per second. Okay, so it allows you to do a little peek in this uh, call rate. Then you have simultaneous calls. All right, so if you have a maximum simultaneous incoming call, if you cannot receive more than 200 calls from an outside source on this network access point, if there's a, a, another call that is added after those 200, we will refuse the call uh, and the call will not be accepted in the system. All right, so this is to limit calls coming from a specific customer. And we can do the same for outgoing calls or and or total calls. All right, so you can have uh, 200 incoming, 200 outgoing, and 200 total, for example. Okay, so then we will limit, make sure there's never more than 200 calls on this particular uh, network. Yes, the call burst here. So the, the, um, here when you set a, a specific uh, call rate, okay, outgoing calls per second, here it's, it's 25 calls per second, okay? So if the calls are evenly distributed every second, you can have 25 calls per second. But maybe at some point you have in one second 25 calls and then the next second you have zero calls. And then the next second, you have maybe 30 calls per second uh, in that time frame. okay? So if you, you don't put any burst value here, it's going to be limited at 25. The five others will not be accepted. But if you give it a few calls here, let's say I want five more calls per second, but burst only, so not sustained. So in that particular second, you will be able to go to 30. But then after that, the next second, you will need to go and have uh, less calls than 25, maybe 20. Okay, And that is a, a, a calculation over time to make sure that you don't go over your 25 calls per second um, in time, Okay, not specifically per second. Is it a bit clearer? Yes, okay. Now, if you, use, um, if you use a domain, you will need to configure the DNS. And as I said yesterday, there's two places to configure DNS, but here we're talking about the DNS for SIP and it is configured here in the DNS um, segment of this uh, configuration. Okay. So you will see it on the web portal, this DNS here. Um, then parameters you can use here is uh, some, let's say global configuration. So uh, do you want to enable uh, caching? So if you have detected a uh, one domain name, then uh, you may want to cache it so you don't need to go to the DNS server again. Uh, here, I think, I'm not sure, I think we changed the default value. It seems a bit big here, 12 hours, but uh, you can change that to make it uh, smaller. Okay. Then once you've enabled your uh, DNS uh, service, you can define multiple DNS server. And um, you also define from which local interface these uh, DNS requests will be made from. So for example, here, uh, this is, I know this is my private network. All right, and so this is a private IP address that I'm using for a, a local DNS uh, service, All right? And then I have another uh, one running also in my private network as a backup. 
And then I have another one, which is this one going to the public network and using a, a, a public uh, DNS okay, for, the, for resolving the domain names. All right, and when you configure the DNS server, it's very simple. You just put the, where, where this DNS server is and from which local interface uh, you want to uh, make the request from. A lot of time, they, they are uh, private networks that you use here, uh, but you can also uh, use any, any IP interface here. Okay. Then the third part, and, and sometimes this is a little bit confusing because uh, you have another set of IP interface to choose. Okay. And this IP interfaces are are defining which IP interfaces can use this DNS group. Right? So if I receive a call on one of those IP interfaces here, defined here, I will use this DNS configuration. Right? And here you see I haven't put everything. So if I receive a call on this uh, network, it will not use this DNS group. So you can really divide your network and, and have different DNS groups per interface that you have in the system. All right. But I agree, sometimes it's a bit uh, confusing because you have the IP interface used for the DNS request and you have the, DNS, the IP interface used for the incoming call to decide which DNS group we want to send to. Uh, and then here you can put some local entries. So if you know uh, some of these, uh, the domain uh, IP will not change, you can do it here. Or just for, uh, just for testing, you can uh, do this here. Okay? So uh, it will return the appropriate, um, sorry, the appropriate information for this particular DNS, okay? DNS request. Then we have a network address translation. So I mentioned this uh, yesterday. Uh, you have uh, two, two, network address, two network address translation configuration. One which is a local net, which means that the SBC is sitting behind a firewall. And you have the remote net where then the remote system is sitting behind a firewall. So if I go to the local network access point, uh, there's more than one mode, but it's al almost always the same mode that is being used. When we send the uh, SIP message from the SBC, we insert in the SIP packet the uh, public IP of the firewall here. Because usually we would have included the one port IP address here, but now we're using the firewall IP address here. So it adds the public IP of the firewall in the SIP messages. This local NAT configuration can be different for SIP and RTP. So if a SIP goes through this interface here and RTP goes through another interface here, then you, uh, you can have two different configuration. One which has the SIP with this public IP and one here for RTP which has this public IP because uh, SIP can use one IP interface and RTP can use another IP interface. Right, so you don't have to use the same IP interface for uh, SIP and RTP. Okay. The remote net configuration. Uh, you have uh, two modes here. Uh, one is called uh, automatic. Okay, so we validate the uh, contact IP that we receive uh, from the remote side here. And uh, that's mostly used for SIP. And then for RTP, we use the 
IP port of the last, oh no, that's still for SIP, sorry. The NAT for SIP. Uh, we use uh, the, the IP port of the last SIP packet. So when we receive the SIP packet here, we analyze what we receive and we figure out that this is where we need to send the information, okay? Which will then be relayed to the uh, public, uh, to, the, to the, um, the, the phone that is sitting behind the uh, remote firewall. So either the contact IP of what you receive or the IP port of the uh, SIP packet. For RTP, it's a little bit different. Uh, the configuration is to wait to receive the first packet, the first, I should say here, RTP packet before sending. So what happens is that when we uh, negotiate the SIP, we will understand uh, the, the uh, information about the RTP. However, we will not know from which IP this will come. Uh, so what we do is we just wait to receive the first RTP packet. When, once we get it, then we know where to send it. Uh, so you only need to say, okay, I want to use remote netting and you select the passive mode here and, and the rest is done automatically. So when we open up the uh, service here, uh, any traffic that comes in uh, or, or the first packet that comes in for this traffic will be analyzed and then we, we, we will reconfigure the RTP here so that we send to the appropriate IP on the remote side. Okay, so this could be, this can be a little bit tricky, but the only thing, only thing you need to know is, is the remote side behind the net or not? Okay. If it's behind the net, you must enable this, this mode. If it's not behind the net, well, it's, it, will, it will still work if you enable this mode, but it's better if you do not, because we prefer to start sending RTP as soon as the connection is open instead of waiting for the first RTP packet to be received, right? Because if both sides here do the same configuration, well, both sides will be waiting for the RTP packet to come in, so there will be no traffic uh, flowing through, all right? So we have to be uh, careful here when we configure this. So you need to know, are you behind a, a network access uh, uh, a, a firewall or are, is the remote side before behind the firewall? Okay, and then when you are on a cloud instance, you uh, always need local net traversal. All right, so, and because you, uh, and because you always need it, and sometimes it's, uh, it's not so easy to, to find out the, the public IP that is on the network. We created a, a variable that's called uh, AWS uh, IP on uh, voice over IP. Okay, so uh, that's for AWS. Okay? And then this public IP address is automatically put on the uh, NAT as a force public IP, All right? And the name is always this one, NAT traversal. So in each of the uh, network access point that you configure, all right, you just need to make sure that you have uh, NAT traversal enabled for each one of them. So local NAT will need to be the NAT traversal. You see the name here is the same as what is configured for the uh, network access point. All right. Then for the remote method, well, it depends on the remote side. So in this case, we enabled it. So that means the remote side is also behind a uh, firewall on their side okay. or, or a, a firewall or a CPE device or anything that is not directly on the public uh, network. Okay, so the question from James is, how about both, both if both sides are using uh, netting, okay? 
so so um uh, yeah so so when when both sides use net it's like this right so you have a force passive mode and maybe automatic net traversal here there's uh, other options i can show you in a minute there and then uh, local net traversal that that works as well all right so it's it's okay to have both modes uh, enabled except that the remote side needs to start sending traffic right it needs to start sending rtp traffic so you, uh, we need to be careful there so that uh, it works in all cases okay So let me show you some things here. Oops, not this one. Uh, what about this one here? Yeah, okay. Okay, so the things I talked about here, let me just make it a little bit bigger if you have questions uh, it's a good time to ask them so you see the things i showed today is uh, ip interfaces here dns sip here profiles and network access points and also net okay so we covered all these uh, items here if i go here in uh, ip interfaces I can see all the uh, IP interfaces that are configured on the system. You see here you have uh, control zero, control one, management zero. It's using DHCP. Uh, oh, and the thing I didn't mention here is uh, the control zero port. So these are for connecting one plus one system together. There is a default IP that is used for th this internal control network. And uh, it will choose uh, specific IPs when you do it. However, if that conflicts with your other internal uh, IPs running on your network, then you can modify the default uh, IP range for this control network. So that's in the initial configuration. At, at some place it says uh, change internal subnet and you can change that. All right, but normally uh, you should keep the default IPs here. Um, what else I wanted to show here? Yes, okay, so you have these, all the, these tabs here. One is Ethernet ports. So these are all the Ethernet ports that are uh, available on my system. So you have some of them are control, some of them are LAN WAN, some of them are management, okay? Here in virtual ports, then you can configure your uh, VLANs, right? So if you have uh, if you have it controlled by the hypervisor in the uh, virtual machine, then when you go and you want to configure your virtual port, uh, you will put here untagged. Uh, you will create a new OS VLAN untanked. But here you see I still called it 600 because I know that in my hypervisor, this is VLAN 600 that has been configured on my hypervisor. Okay. But here at this level, I need to configure untanked. The other example I gave you earlier on is um, this one, VP all which means uh, the configuration that is done on the hypervisor is 4,096 and it's using, uh, it's a, like a open VLAN usage. And here I can configure two VLANs or, or more VLANs as I need it. And if I click on the VLAN configuration itself, uh, you just have to put the uh, VLAN ID, right? So that's the only thing you know. If you, do, if you need to use untag, you just click here Otherwise, you put VLAN ID. And then uh, there's options here, allow uh, ping 
and allow IP fragmentation. So this should be always set here. This one, it's your choice. You can enable it or disable it. Okay, and you see, for example, here, if I select uh, control zero, you see I can't change anything, right? The, the choices are not, uh, it's not possible to change anything in this uh, configuration. Okay, so the only way to change this is to do reset all scroll, and then you will go back to the initial configuration uh, of the system. The question is, can I, okay, so if I go here in IP interface here, so you have um, various uh, IPs. So for example, here I'm using uh, WAN 800. So I, I know I'm on VLAN 800 here and I have this IP address and I'm using this uh, subnet and gateway. And the question from Adam is, can I put the same uh, gateway? And here you see, I do have the same gateway here using a different IP and on a different network like that. Right? So it's possible to do that and see, I get the same gateway at many, many places here. So you can do that. Um, and okay, just, just to explain also, there's some confusion sometimes uh, per, IP interface that is configured here, you can have a, a gateway. And when we send a call on this, using this particular IP interface, it will make sure that it uses this gateway, All right? So each one of them are attached to its own IP interface. That's why I can have multiple gateways here. Um, yeah, this is not here so important, but you can see who uses the RTP port range. Some of them are unused, like this one here. Okay, for IP interfaces, that's fine. Um, then I talked about SIP here. If you, uh, normally you just have one SIP stack per, per system. And then you have these configuration you can do. The ones that are important are down here, right? The transport server, this will tell where you will receive or send, from which interface you will receive or send uh, your SIP traffic. But you also have other configuration here, like the quarks I told you, so you can set and modify the quarks. Uh, this one is not important. Timers is, uh, you know, in, in, various places in the configuration, you can set timers, but normally you don't change those uh, default timers in the system, but if you need to, they are available. Oops. And then you can uh, adjust the other parameter. For example, you can set a uh, user agent name on the system. Uh, the domain we use on our system here, uh, you can use subject organization. So these are additional headers that will be shown in the, um, in the SIP messages. Here I talked about also uh, about prax. So by default, we say supported. That means we will accept if the remote side sends us uh, prax and we will not force it. We will not enforce it. So supported, then you can choose uh, if you want to make it required. Um, uh, this one here, we get the question yesterday on that. So it just says it will support, uh, it will support um, relaying CIPRIC. Okay, right now I have it disabled and you see when it's, it's not the default, you will see the parameter is in yellow here, meaning that this setting has been changed and it is not the default. So I can, I can here, for example, put it back to on and then, oops, I go back to SIP stack in the other parameters. You see now uh, support session recording is now uh, the same color as the rest. That means this is the default value that is being set in the system. And there's other little things like insert date, insert supported, header, allow header. So 
Uh, I've seen some places uh, where they say, well, you should not insert the allow header, so you can just disable it here and then uh, save it. And then uh, it will not send the allow header in the set messages. Okay, and here you see it's now yellow because it's not the default. Yeah, so uh, does it support prank? So the answer is yes. So uh, to force using prank, you need to set here required. And th this it will uh, tell the other side, you must use prank and the call will not be accepted if, if it doesn't accept using prank. Uh, but most of the time you just put supported here and if the remote side supports it, it's gonna automatically be used in the uh, communication. Then you have the SIP session timer that uh, I, I talked to you about. So by default, it is enabled and it's the default is 30 minutes. So if the default is 30 minutes and it has been accepted like that by the remote side, it's gonna be uh, the SIP uh, communication will be refreshed every 15 minutes. So we will send a new uh, SIP invite uh, depending on which side has been chosen as the SIP refresher, but if it's if it's the SBC, after 15 minutes, it's going to send a uh, SIP refresh, and it will wait for the answer. If it has no, uh, not receive any responses for 30 minutes, then it's going to uh, drop this call. There is also a uh, minimum value here of 90 seconds, so the remote side can ask for a SIP session refresh. Uh, up to 90 seconds or as low as 90 seconds and we will accept it. If they ask a refresh of uh, 30 seconds, it will be refused unless you change this here to 30 seconds. Okay. So at 30 seconds, so every 15 seconds, there will be a refresh sent to the remote side. Okay. Then here we have the profiles. So the profiles, um, see I've created multiple profiles like this. Most of the time what we do is we take the default profile and we just copy it, right? So we say copy the default profile and, and we give it a new name like this, right? And then you modify it starting from this a uh, new profile. So then we know that it is uh, identical to the default one. And then we may want to go here and then say, well, for example, in this profile, the SDP will be uh, not using G723. So you just disable uh, payload type number four and uh, you can call it uh, no G723 for example. Okay, so now I have this, this profile and when you go in your network access points here, you see you have different profiles that are being used. So if I choose one like this, I can say now my profile that I want to use for this SNAP is no G723. Okay, so any modification I, I do to this, this uh, profile will be attached to this snap as well. So if I go in this uh, profile, I can see the parameters we talked about in the presentation. And you know, if you uh, go over these items, it will explain briefly uh, what it is, right? Every time you go over one particular element, it's gonna tell you what it does. Uh, most of the time it's pretty clear, uh, but if you are not sure about this option, you can just ask uh, our support team and we'll help you to uh, understand what it means, okay? So this is the uh, uh, 
uh, SDP configuration I told you about. So by default, you see it's it's pretty short because there's only 101 that is a uh, dynamic payload type, and this is for the uh, DTMF events that will be sent in the RTP stream. Uh, the other ones here, uh, 0, 8, 18, well, you don't need to define them because these are static payload types and they are well known. You can at any time remove some of these uh, things. Like for example, a, a lot of people remove comfort noise because they don't want to have that. So you can change this and then uh, you can add the uh, other uh, codecs. Uh, like for example, I could add here uh, 96, but if I do this, then I need to add a new uh, RT meet RTP map for A96 because the system doesn't know what I mean by 96 here. Okay. Um, if you go on the wiki, so on the wiki here and you search for payload types, payload type. Profile SDP description. Here it will give you the default um, the default SDP description that we have. Explain some of the things here. Show you some of these uh, static payload types. And you see here the ones that are dynamic. So EVRC, QCell, okay. So these are all dynamic. So if you want to support them you can add them uh, something like this. So if you want to use ILBC, so you could just add this in your here like this. Well, this is 97. So here I need to put 97. All right, so this then means I support ILBC using this, uh, this payload type. But you know, even if I put 97 here, since it's a, a dynamic payload type, and if I receive a call from a, a source that has ILBC defined the same way here, and it uses something else than the 97, we will still accept it, okay? Here it just means that we can accept uh, this type of dynamic payload, and it's defined here. Uh, yes, I wanted to show also on the wiki here, you have uh, some examples of a more detailed uh, payload type. And I wanted to show you also, for example, like uh, GSM, GSM uh, FR okay, is defined here. So you can add more or AMR, AMR wideband is also a popular uh, vocoder. So you can add this into the SDP definition. Okay. Here I presented you also these parameters here, generate uh, 180, 183 SDP mode. So you can map various cases of 180 and 183 adaptation from source to destination. Yeah, some stuff are, are for uh, SS7 and, and uh, other networks, so you don't need to bother about this. I talked about the uh, enable the SIP custom header parameter. So by default, I see here it's enabled. So the routing scripts will be able to receive custom SIP headers, so headers that are not uh, uh, standard ones, and will be able to process them in the routing scripts. Yeah, and there's various options here. So most of the time, the default options uh, cover most of the cases, but you can uh, modify them. If you are not sure uh, which parameter are uh, able to do such and such uh, tweak in the networks, then you can ask us and we can uh, steer you to the right place or you can try to search it on the, uh, on the wiki and it can help you to find these settings. 
RTP and RDO, I showed you, I showed you uh, no RX packets, which is here. Uh, by default, RTCP is always enabled. Okay, so if you want to remove this, you can do this. RTCP will always be using the uh, port that the RTP is using plus one. So all the RTP is passing on the uh, even ports and the RTCP is passing on the uh, odd ports. And uh, there is some exchange done end to end and it give, can give you additional statistic information on the uh, traffic that you're being, you're passing to the remote side. Of course, both sides need to support RTCP for this to work uh, correctly. Uh, but here by default, we always enable it. Okay. The RTCP information uh, can be uh, stored in the call detail records. Okay, and we will show you this uh, tomorrow or the next day. Um, yeah, fax modem relay by default, uh, it will just pass. If the system switches to T38, it will just pass. If the system pass uh, switches to pass through, it will just pass the traffic. So this is uh, automatically handled by the system. This is uh, obsolete for the SBC. Uh, tone and call progress option, I told you, you can override the uh, ring back tone that is being used. So you, the default is to forward uh, the information from outgoing to incoming leg, but you can uh, do things like always play a ringtone or here it says uh, forward the ring back tone from outgoing to incoming if it is there. And if it is not there, then we play the ringtone from the SVC. And you need to have the transcoding device to allow this. Okay. And then if you click on the reason cause mapping at the bottom, I showed you this yesterday as well. You have uh, 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 settings you can use and, and you have to go at the SIP uh, level, which is starting at 300, right? So then here you can configure changing the uh, reason cause. So by default, it's always matched, right? 400 incoming, 400 outgoing. But if you want to change the 401 to be something else, you can just go here and modify it to something else, another uh, reason, SIP reason cause. Okay, then you have the uh, network access points we talked about. So here uh, they are uh, just uh, some examples of this. You have the profile we talked about earlier on, uh, the IP address of destination, but it's also which IP you will accept incoming into this NAP. Um, you can poll the remote side, okay? This is using SIP option messages. If you want the SBC to register to another uh, carrier outgoing registration. This is where you will uh, configure this. So you just need to put the address to register and the uh, authentication parameters here. Uh, network address translation. That's if you're using uh, NATing. So by default, uh, any bare metal or VMware system have no uh, NAT configuration. So if you need to configure NAT network address station, then you need to go here in the NAT segment, create new NAT traversal. Whoops, I went too fast. All right, so create new NAT traversal uh, here. And then uh, you have two modes that are supported, but uh, I think only the first one uh, I've seen used. And um, it says force the local public IP address in SIP and RTP packets. So you can here put the 
uh, public IP that you are using and you just give it a name so that it can be recognized uh, in the system. Once you have created your net here, you can then select it in the network address sensation if you need to. Okay. And you see it's uh, different for RTP and SIP. So it could be a different public IP for each one of them. The remote uh, method is only, uh, you just choose the mode you want to use. So uh, for specific mode is the one we use usually. And then uh, two ways here, automatic net reversal or force use of public IP. Now, uh, one thing I did not uh, talk about today, I talked about it yesterday, is SIPI. SIPI is very simple to configure, meaning that you just need to enable it for it to work. Okay, so if you enable this, this means now this network access point is a SIPI compliant network access point, and we will include the ISOP or, or SS7 ISOP information inside the SIP uh, information. Okay. So you can also configure here the, the variant of ISOP you are using and the content type is just a text box here. So you can add, uh, you can type anything here that will be accepted by the remote side. The default is ITUT. Okay. And if I go in advanced parameters, this is where I get the uh, call rate limiting Feature so you can set maximum incoming calls, call bursts, calls per second, uh, and you can configure all of this here. Then uh, here you have the access control list. So I talked to you uh, about this. So you can just set your IP that you want to use here with your uh, subnet and then you'll be able to receive calls from this uh, subnet. Okay. In addition to the IP we have set here uh, initially. Okay. And then the port range here is actually the RTP port range we want to use. So this is defined in the IP interfaces. So most of the time it's the same interface as what is used for the SIP transport server, but uh, it could be different. And the last thing we talked about uh, today is the DNS. Here I have no DNS. Let me just check if I can find the one here. Oops, where's my connection? Uh, this one. Oops, not this. Okay, and um, if I go here in DNS, yes, okay. So you have a DNS group here. Mo most of the time you'll need only one uh, DNS group. And uh, then you define if you want to use it here. And each one of those DNS servers, you have to specify from which IP interface you want to access those uh, DNS servers, and it can be a diff different per DNS server. And here you can define uh, from which IP interface we will use those DNS. Uh, you can just put them all if you want and add them all into the uh, here so that everybody will uh, use this DNS server to do the DNS queries. But if, um, if you uh, have different ones, then you can just uh, use the ones you want, okay? 
and then you can create local entries like this. So if there is a, a NAP that has a domain name configured, and before sending a call, it's gonna use one of those DNS to uh, uh, find the correct IP for sending this, uh, sorry, for sending the traffic. Okay. So that's all I had to show for the uh, SIP portion of the configuration. Any questions on this?